Um, there's a lot of uh, arguments out there that people say, well, you should put emojis in your subject lines. And because it, it catches people's interest and it engages and it helps you with open rates and conversions and stuff. So we're like, okay, well, let's give this a try, right? We hadn't done it up to this point. And so, you know, we went in and A-B tested those things. And we A-B tested it six ways from Sunday because we found that when you used emojis, we got fewer conversions, fewer opens and less revenue. Like we started selling this product out of the trunk of our car. Don't be afraid to fail. Inventory management is about balance. Get the product out, that's number one. I've always preached sustainable growth. So we just started building community. Look at the data. Product development is everything. Yeah, we say we're a brick, click, and pop. But you have to love what you do. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Merchant Mastery Podcast. I am joined today by a good friend of mine that I've met. I think it, we met in 2020, but I feel like we've met more than once, <laughs> two or three times. It's uh, Richard Bell from UntilGone.com. This is one of the biggest deal sites on this here planet Earth. And I first met Richard because uh, our team Socialite was doing a Shopify meetup tour. We had like four locations mapped out. We were going to go to Vancouver and Seattle and San Diego and Los Angeles. And we were able to make it out to Vancouver and Seattle. And our Shopify tour was canceled due to the pandemic and everything. But uh, I'm really, really glad that even though we're stuck at home, we're able to meet with merchants in Seattle and everywhere through this great technology we have. So everybody, without further ado, I would like to bring out my good friend and a very advanced, experienced, phenomenal e-commerce store owner, Richard Bell. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. It's nice to be here. Appreciate you uh, inviting me back on again. Yeah, I, th I think uh, the, the pleasure is certainly, certainly, certainly all ours. I know uh, this is funny that every time I see you, we kind of bring this up, that uh, <laughs> we're looking at like Shopify store rankings. And I'm pretty sure when we first met you, that your store was ranked like the 600th out of 1 million. And my colleague, Brandon, who's, who's here in the, in the panel behind the scenes, he keeps checking, he keeps checking on the story because he's like, how's Richard doing? Because we know that you're just like, I think you've like tripled your business a few years in a row and it just keeps on going on an upward trajectory. And uh, we, we, I think we looked in that, that data site and it was like, you're in like the top 100 now. So it's a great honor to have you. I know you've built a phenomenally successful e-commerce business. And today I, we're, we want to jump into some data questions. We want to talk about kind of what, what's been going on with you since we last met. Yeah, no, I'm happy to share. Uh, we, we are definitely seeing... Uh, huge growth, which is uh, exciting and starting to put some you know, pressure on the team, but it's good pressure. It's a good problem to have. So for anyone who's just tuning in, like maybe nobody was in Seattle with us, probably mostly everyone wasn't. Uh, can you give us a little background? I know um, you have a great story about like the old name and how you uh, acquired an existing business and transformed it into this e-commerce monster that it is. Sure. I'll give you a quick overview. Um, so uh, this business was actually founded way back in the dark ages of the internet, 2005, um, and was a company name at the time with Yugster, uh, which is not exactly the greatest brand name anyone's ever come up with. And we ended up uh, acquiring the business in uh, 2018. It was uh, somewhat in decline at that point. And uh, part of our strategy was rebranding it and relaunching it with a new site, new look, uh, which is what brought us onto Shopify in the first place. And um, since then, like you said, uh, we've seen great growth uh, that with uh, this year has really accelerated uh, immensely. Um, but part of our, our strategy was rebranding, relaunching, polishing it up, um, expanding the vendors and partners that we work with. Uh, and really sort of focusing heavily on customers. And a big piece of that, as you and I have talked about, uh, both in Seattle and in other, other conversations, has been really driven by paying attention to the data. Um, my team hates when I start talking about KPIs because they're so sick of hearing it, but we measure everything and we react to it. And we test and test and then test again. If there is not an A-B test going on in a given week, then something's wrong. Um, where, you know, whether it's site AB or email AB, 
trying to figure out what's working, what's not. And that's been our process from day one. Um, advertisement tested everything, every variation, every click, every path that people took, um, different tools, different platforms, different types of ads, what worked, what didn't work, tested the website, tested emails, right? Even things as basic as what is the send from name on an email, we're testing that. Um, whether we use emoticons and titles, um, emojis, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've tested everything just to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what turns our customers off, what turns them on, you know, what makes them want to buy. Uh, and that's really what's driven, I think, a lot of the progress that we've made. So, so would you say, like, what are, what are some of the areas that, like, because it can be overwhelming. Like, I, you know, you're telling me you've got to split test ads and emails and landing page copy and offers and all these kinds of things. What are some of the, like, top two, like, if, if I was intimidated by data up until now like if i was like hey i want to do data but i'm intimidated by what richard's telling me i, I don't like I'm, I'm not an engineer and scientist and i don't have the capacity to go and split test every single thing i do what are some like the, the key ones that you cannot ignore that you like have to go and split test otherwise you're missing out on a lot of opportunity well i mean that's a difficult question to answer in some ways because it really depends on the business that you're running now, in our case, for example, a very large percentage of our uh, uh, revenue actually comes from our installed customer base via email market. And that's because as a deal site, we're offering new deals every single day. So we'll have a morning email or an afternoon email and there'll be a significant change in, uh, or each day there are brand new deals that are going out that we want our customers to see. And so, with you know somewhere between 45 and 50 percent of our revenue coming from email marketing we really can optimize our results by getting our email marketing to tune in just about perfectly but if you're a business that doesn't rely on email marketing it's a whole different game plan right because let's say you've only got a start you're a startup so you don't have a mailing list or you've only got you know a mailing list that's generating five maybe ten percent of your revenue it's not nearly as relevant to you, in which case, then you would really want a metric on things like ads that might be driving the bulk of your traffic. And so the way I would answer that question is actually by asking you, where's your traffic coming from today? And then optimize that. Now, you know, one of my big goals is to manage risk by having a good solid blend of traffic sources. But if you're in a startup mode and you're seeing, you know, 95% of your traffic is coming from uh, paid advertisement of some kind or paid search, perhaps, then that's what you would want to optimize and make it as effective as possible because you don't really have another channel to get into. So it depends on where traffic is coming from and what stage of your life cycle is on. If you're, you know, let's say you're, you're into your business, it's a little bit more mature, you've been optimizing ads and they work pretty well. And now you're saying, well, wait a minute, why am I not getting repeat business? Why am all my traffic coming from that? I might say, start marketing to your, your, your uh, install base with email marketing. And then I'd say, optimize that. So where are you in the life cycle? Um, what have you, what have you looked at? Um, what has worked? What has not worked for you, et cetera. That's where you would start focusing your attention on your data. And, and, you know, to your I guess question really what you're trying to get at is I don't think that you need to boil the ocean with data. You can, there, there's so many numbers out there. I mean, you go into even just uh, Google analytics. I mean, there's a tons and tons of numbers out there. Narrow it down, look at something basic, right? What am I going to optimize? Well, customer acquisition. So work on that for a few months, right? Don't, don't necessarily try to work on, customer acquisition and website page views and click stream paths and conversion rates. And you don't have to do it all at once, right? You've got to look at your funnel, break it down. And I know Socialite has a nice, you know, sort of workflow about how to get through this. But one of the things you want to do is break it down, look at where your uh, things are working and where things are not working, and then start optimizing one thing at a time. And once you've got that optimized, move on to the next one. And you know what, in a year, you might be back where you started optimizing the same thing that you did the first time, but that's okay. Business, you know, it's, it's a cycle. You're going to constantly be tuning and improving things. So start with something that you can handle, 
Start with something that's important to you today. If you're a startup, that's acquisition. There's nothing else you care about. Yeah. That's a, good, that's a really good point. Actually, you were just like some light bulbs were coming on in my head and behind me in the boardroom here. Uh, <laughs> just, so some ideas were popping up, but I was just thinking like, I was just talking to an e-commerce store owner, like a Shopify store owner earlier on today. And we're, we're just getting into some theory. It was just like a friend. It was not a client of ours, just a friend. And I was, I was saying I'd rather like in, in the e-commerce world, the biggest asset is like your community or email list. Like to grow sustainably, you need an email list of existing or past customers that you can resell to. So it's like, I'd rather sell to an email list all day than try and acquire new customers all day, which is a really expensive task. Yep. So, so to, to like confirm what you're saying, it's like, um, it depends on what life cycle you're at. If you have a big email list, you, you want to like cater value to those people and not like, scare them off. So you want to make sure that the content you're putting on email is absolute best in performance. Well, and that, I mean, that gets into, you know, my favorite e-commerce term of all time is, is customer lifetime value, right? So, you know, when you've got an email list, it's probably from people that have made purchase from you before, and you're looking at maximizing that, you know, value of that customer over time. So I totally agree with you. But, you know, if, if, if we're talking about merchant, you know, mastering sort of the basic premise of what we're doing here today, it really is about where you are in that life cycle. If, if you're just launching a store and you don't have an email list, you know, fine, but start building one, right? And, and start going down that path. But different, different pieces of data will play. In email marketing, we do tons of A-B testing on layout, content, what's included, what's not included. And, and we just, we split our list and, and, you know, whether you're using MailChimp or Klaviyo or, you know, whatever other tools are out there, they make it easy to do because they expect you and want you to do this. And so you split your list in two or into some percentage breakdown, you try one email, try a different email and see what works, right? So if you get more, you know, if you're optimizing for opens, right, then change the subject line see what happens with two different subject lines, different styles. Um, if you're optimizing for clicks, change the layout, change a little bit of the graphics, see what happens, test it, and then do it three or four times. And if you find it works, adopt it. If it doesn't, get rid of it, right? And it's really about that constant testing. But if you're in a different you know, stage of your life cycle and you're just trying to get visibility around it, then you're probably going to be paying for ads. And so because that's so expensive, as, you know, you haven't gotten those initial customers, you better be testing the heck, heck out of that, right? Because every ad that you pay for, right, whether it's Facebook or Google or wherever you've stuck them out there, each ad is going to cost you. And if you're not testing to make sure that that ad is as effective as possible, right, the graphics, the layout, the text, the appearance of it, then you're missing an opportunity. And the thing with ads is you're not just missing an opportunity, I guess, you're, you're burning cash, right? Let's be honest about it, right? You're, you're investing in marketing to get customers at that point. If your ads are not optimized, you're wasting some of that. And so I think a big piece of what I, we do with ads is we'll test different versions. And again, it's easy, right? You run two campaigns right next to each other. One gets more customers than the other, that's the, yeah, that's the one you ramp up your spend on, right? Start small, spend a little bit, see what works, and then turn up the dial, right? So okay, again, yeah. I think like full disclaimer here, I just wanted to invite you here today just so I could personally get smarter. <laughs> I, you get me going every time we do this, Scott. I start talking about <laughs> data and get, run away with it. So I, I'm going to shut up and let you ask some questions. No, I, like, I walk away with a little kick in the butt that's like, hey, like, you, you're like opening up all these things that I know we could be do like, you got to commit, you got to commit. And like, we, we're an agency. So we work with like many different campaigns. And it's like, we don't really have the resources to like, do it to this level. But there's little simple things that you could do. Like, like you're saying, so, so let's pretend that we don't have an email list. So like, okay. two seconds Are ago, you? I was saying, two seconds ago, I was like, you have an email list, you got to focus on split testing the email data. But customer acquisition, you don't have an email list, you're a new business, you're a startup, that's scary business. Like you're investing you need to finance that startup and you're going to like start driving leads. You need to make most of it or you're going to sink. It's like a scary, scary time. So like we, we, we do quite a bit of split testing. I'd say a fair amount, but like the way that you're wording it is just like, if you, if you aren't split testing it, you are blowing money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, and maybe you got it right the first time, right? So maybe you're not, but the odds are that it, I would, I would say that we have never, ever seen anything that we've done, whether it was an ad or an email, be perfect out of the box, that nothing, no improvements could possibly be made. So even our most successful things that we've done, you know, an ad that we've put out there, we've always found ways to tweak it. And it might be small changes. But one of the things that's just really, you know, kind of struck me about e-commerce as I got into it, you know, when we bought the business, has just been how even very small changes can have a material impact. And ultimately, it sort of brings back the idea, and I think we've talked about this before, um, is that, you know, this is a game of inches. There's very few things that you from, you know, zero to a hundred, right out, you know, flick, switch, everything's perfect, boom, I've got the, you know, huge business drawing crazy. What you're going to end up doing is, you know, a hundred different little steps to get from zero to a hundred. And that's okay. And it might improve your conversion rate by 0.1% or your customer acquisition rate by 0.1% or 0.2% or something small. But you do enough of those and all of a sudden you're getting material growth. Right? Like how, like, I love that. How important is that? Is that concept to like, like, you know, we work with all kinds of e-commerce businesses. We always think you got to like crawl, walk, run. So yeah. sometimes we're helping people get from crawl to walk. Sometimes we're helping people get from walk to run, or sometimes we're helping people get from run to sprint. But like, I think um, a lot of people in like the crawl walk stage, it's like every dollar counts. And like I, I work with, we work with a lot of merchants and they're like, I don't want to buy that app. I don't want to buy this because these are my costs. Like I don't have a lot of room. Like my margin is tight yeah. because these are my fixed costs. So like how much of an impact does that make? If you can incrementally improve like your ROAS by, by one or even half one and your email revenue by a 0.25, like that impacts your margin, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and I, look, I totally get it, right? When, when we bought the company, we were very conservative on spend. You know, there were apps and things like that that we would say, nope, we don't want to do that. Or, you know, we didn't want to go down this path or that path. And, and we were really trying to manage the money because, you know, we didn't want to do something stupid and, and waste it. And at the time when we bought the company, the margins were tight and kind of messed up, right? But what we recognize at the same time as that is that you have to spend money to make money. And that's, you know, kind of trite. It's a truism that, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard at some point. But if you don't take a thousand bucks and spend it on ads, you're never going to know what you're going to do with those ads to make them work, right? And you take that thousand dollars and you optimize the ads and get them to work. You've got to make some investments in order to grow. And if you then go in and you take that, you know, $1,000 and you learn, right? So I'll give, you a, I'll give you a concrete example here. We started, we had lots of problems getting Google ads to really work for us. And there was a ton of issues around it, mostly um, tied to data feeds going back and forth between um, our, our, our Shopify and uh, Google Merchant Center and then optimizing the web pages so that they have the right sort of hidden tracking data and all that kind of stuff, right? So we got all of that, you know, sort of tuned up and, and fixed. And what we ended up doing with Google is just starting with a small spend. It was like 10 bucks a day. Nothing that would break the bank. And what we did is we used that to start tweaking and testing and tuning while we were making all these changes to how the data feeds worked, what information was being sent, how we were, you know, setting up the ads and optimizing them, 10 bucks a day. And then we went from, okay, that's working great to ramp it up. And so we would start doubling and doubling again and doubling again. And our ad spend, I won't even tell you what it is now, but it's, you know, thousands of dollars, right, a month that were tens of thousands of dollars a month that we, we spend on this stuff. Is it $10,000 a day? Um, not quite that much, no. <laughs> um, someday we'll get there. But okay. <laughs> the key thing is in, in what we got to is we found a point where every single dollar we spend on ads is profitable. So a lot of times with ads, you get, it's a loss leader, right? It's a customer acquisition cost. You bring the customer in, you manage for lifetime value. In our business, we don't do that uh, because there's so much turnover and churn through it. But 
we've gotten to the point where every single ad that we place is actually a profitable ad for every single product, every click that's coming through. And so we're managing, a, you know, sort of cost over revenue, looking at it as sort of a margin spend to acquire, you know, that sale. And because every, every penny, every dollar that goes out is profitable, we can just ramp it up until it no longer is, right? You hit that break point and you stop. And so that maximizes, you know, what's coming in. And it's because we started small, right? Your example of, I don't, I don't want to spend money on apps. I don't want to spend money on this. I don't want because I'm just starting it. You got to spend some money, but you can be very smart about it. And you can mm -hmm. start small, tune it, tune it, tune it, and then expand it. And then that's the safe way to do this exact sort of customer acquisition. So if I'm, if I'm a new business, a new merchant, right, or I'm just in sort of those early crawl stages trying to figure out what's going on, I need customers, right? You can't buy email lists. It doesn't work. It's, it's a myth, right? It's just, you might as well burn cash. I tried it. I tested it. It didn't work, right? So I can tell you, like, you know, we, we, we went down that path to see if there was some value there. There really is not. But what we then did with ads is exactly what I think a startup would have to do, right? Is get out there, spend 10 bucks a day, optimize, optimize, optimize until you get the results that you want for that $10 spend and then make it 25 bucks a day and then make it $100 a day and keep testing, keep measuring, making sure that that $100 spend is as good for you as the $10. And if it is, well, 100 is 200 right? And then 200 is 400. And you keep going because hopefully what you're measuring is that those ads are bringing customers who are then buying stuff from you. And then you start building your email list and you're creating this sort of ongoing cycle. Um, so. Yeah. I, I, I usually like divide it in my mind. I I've, I've, like, we're big advocates of digital marketer. I think I've mentioned them to you before. They're like a big institute in Texas. They train us a lot on our methodologies. We're like a partner of them, but they, they kind of always break up the business model into uh, acquisition, activation, monetization, retention. Right. So it's basically like I'm acquiring and then to me, I don't even say activation because I think it's just acquisition. Like you're, you're investing in acquiring customers. And then I would say, then you're ascending them to a second purchase and a third purchase and fourth purchase and retain them for lifetime now. Right. So I think that a key takeaway that we're already talking about is kind of, we talked about ads. That's like, you're going to like split test everything, optimize everything acquisition. It's going to be things like ads, like landing page, copy, offer, that kind of stuff, would you say? We don't do a lot with landing pages in our business just because of the turnover is so high. Um, but we, because we land our customers um, directly on the products that they expressed interest in via the ad. Um, but in general, in, you know, in, in terms of what you're talking about, yes, yeah, that is absolutely the case. And uh, it would be a, a, a perfect example of, something to test and optimize is your landing page. If you're doing say brand advertisement, for example. I just switched audio. Can you hear me now still? I can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. My, my AirPods are running out. So that was a smooth transition. Okay. So yeah, I think, um, no, it's, that's really interesting. Like, why don't we, so let's talk about youngster for a sec, just to kind of like emphasize the impact that this can have like these little micro optimizations, whether it's ads, you said you don't do much with landing page, but you do lots with emails. You do lots with so far. It's been like subject lines, email, copy, CTAs, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. Like you bought youngster. It was kind of like in a downward sinking trend. Was yeah. It not? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And then like, I think you, if I recall correctly, you bought it in 2018 for the first year, like, year or so you took it from like this downward trajectory back up like what did that look like so when we bought youngster it was shrinking roughly five percent a year um for for a few consecutive years um after we bought it we sort of stopped the bleeding um some of that was just sort of operational stuff inside the company um paying attention to margins and price points and things like that that just needed to be properly managed um, other parts of it were really tied to optimizing that customer experience, right? You use the term activate, you know, I think about it as engage as well, sort of that, the, the whole engagement process. So we had this email list, um, we had a bunch of traffic going through it. Um, we did some advertisement testing, some things worked, some things didn't. The ones that worked, we kept, the rest we dumped. 
but the bulk of it was really a combination of expanding our, you know, optimizing the expanding for what we were doing around email, but then really growing the affiliate side. Um, which we have a fairly large affiliate relationships with a bunch of different places. And that's, you know, another big chunk of our revenue stream. But when we really started seeing the growth was when we rebranded into, into gone, you know, we, over the summer, cause we acquired it in May of 18. Um, really it was sort of a stop the bleed. And so we started seeing kind of small growth, you know, low single digit percentages as we got into even like uh, July kind of time frames, we'd already turned the corner. But it wasn't until we did the Shopify launch on September 1st with the new look and feel and kind of the polish on it. Because um, Youngster was an old dated look. It, it, I mean, it wasn't like a quite a 2005 design, but it was like a 2010 website. Um, and it had gotten very busy with too many graphics and the layouts and it wasn't consistent with sort of modern styles and look and what people expected, right? So we launched September one and it's kind of funny, like I still have the graph, uh, keep the charts around because you see this sort of downward trend and then you see this inflection point over the summer as we bought it and then it hits September 1st and we just start going up. And it's, it's shopping experience, it's look, it's polish, it's brand, it's engagement, it's ease of checkout, it's all of those, you know, sort of basic e-commerce things and you know, that then starts us on an up, upward trajectory. And then we started doing things with really optimizing the customer engagement and capture. And so we had some folks, uh, we, we took a really close look at, we had customers that were, were, were buying from us, but they didn't end up on our email list. They wouldn't set, so sign up. And so we looked at different ways to optimize that and sort of remind people that, hey, you save a bunch of money. Don't you like saving money? Do you want to save money on more things, right? And get our customers to sort of stay re-engaged because as a deal site, we're obviously selling deals and our deals range from, you know, 25% off to sort of 80% off depending on the product. And so everything we sell is discounted people will come to the site, they buy one thing, it should be an easy sell to get them to sign up for a list for something else down the road. Because the people who buy from our sites are bargain hunters, right? They're, they're people that like to shop. So we in, I'm gonna say it's now February of 2019-ish, January, February timeframe, we were really looking hard at our results from Q4, analyzing the data, which you know that, that I love doing. And we were seeing that our signup rates weren't really what we were hoping for. Still high, they're like 65%, but not as high as we would like. So we made some changes. We did some um, activations. Um, we customized a lot of our emails and tested different versions of them. So, you know, like Shopify has all these notifications they send out, right? I'm sure you've worked with customers on optimizing those, but don't just take the defaults, make them yours, right? It would be a good lesson learned. And we had done something, but not as much as I think we should have in hindsight. So we did optimize those in January, really expanded it and made a point about, you know, why would you want to keep the relationship going with us? And our customer re-engagement sort of uh, getting on our list, which is the big metric for us, jumped over 85%. And so we had a 20 point gain basically by optimizing sort of what they were seeing and, and sort of, you know, reinforcing the, hey, you should activate, you should create an account, you should stay with us because you're gonna get more deals and you're gonna get loyalty points and bonuses and savings and, and so on and so forth. And at the end of that, now we're seeing retention rates, you know, north of 85%. Now there's a drop off, right? There's always gonna be some unsubscribes as people are like, well, I get too many emails or I don't, you know, I'm not interested anymore or whatever but we're retaining far more customers than we ever have before. And then that in 2019, I don't want to sort of abuse the metaphors too much. So I'll, I'll leave it out. I was going to say, you know, the flywheel kept going. Right. But, but we spun up even more because now that you start retaining those customers, look, not everyone's going to make a second purchase, but the more customers you retain, the more second purchases you're going to get. And the, once they make a second purchase, the odds of making a third purchase go through the roof. 
it's that it's that hump from one to two that you really want to cross. So yeah, it's hard to acquire a customer in the first place. But if you're thinking about lifetime value, once you've got them, you got to get them from one to two. Because if you go from you know first order to second order, then you got them right. Then you're going to get a third order and a fourth order out there. Right. So, I, always, I always like think about uh, ascension as just that one step yeah. <laughs> from one to two purchases. And once you're there three comes naturally right and so that flywheel took us through 2019 and we were doing a bunch of other testing and optimizations and tweaks as you can imagine but that's really what set us up for growth and part of that you know is things with adding new vendors um, new, new suppliers and partners that we brought into the mix um, and that brought new and more interesting products into what we were able to, to present to people which then led to more engagement and more sales and so it's getting that flywheel going that's hard with e-commerce, but once you can get it going, you can keep tuning and optimizing. And I think Yugster is a really interesting example of a situation where they, it was actually a really, it was one of the very, very first deal sites ever. And I think, you know, there's a lesson out there about this brand that was created that they had a pretty good flywheel going in the beginning and they built it up over years and then it kind of got neglected right? They stopped looking at the right data. They stopped measuring everything. They stopped tweaking and optimizing. And that's when they started to go into decline, right? Now, you know, e-commerce has been growing in the mid-teens year on year for years, right? You know, I don't know different metrics out there, but steady, solid growth. So when you look at like a negative 5% growth in those last few years that, that Yugster was around as Yugster, it's really... 20% below the market at that point. And so it's the, the lesson to take away there is you can't take your eye off the ball. You've got to keep measuring and optimizing and tweaking. Don't get, you know, too distracted, pay attention to the base metrics. And they slid and slid and slid because they weren't paying attention to it. We didn't do anything that was, you know, this wasn't neurosurgery here, like brain surgery or like, you know, fixing people. Um, th this was what's working, not working, test it, tweak it, optimize it, make it better, and then do it again on something else and do it again on something else and do it again on something else. And that's when our growth curve went from this, you know, downward trajectory to a positive trajectory, and then started accelerating. And, you know, we got um, uh, solid growth through 2019 that then coming into 2020, we had even more customers, even more people on our mailing list. And it really, you know, has taken off from that point. And then COVID hit, which, you know, has been a terrible pandemic for people around the world. But for e-commerce has been a huge boost for many, many businesses, not all e-commerce, but large numbers of it, including ourselves. And we're running, you know, uh, 2x what we expected this time of year, uh, 200% over, over or 2x what we would have expected for April and May um, because of the growth in e-commerce. And people, frankly, looking for savings. So. Like, even if I was just looking, thinking about this chart that you talked about, you have stories in there. Like, just compared, got, your, your mic isn't quite plugged in fully, so oh, okay. it's breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now I can't hear you at all. You're still plugged in. How's that? We're good? Yeah. Okay, we're good. We're gonna use a computer audio and I'm good with that. Okay. You gotta, you gotta, be, you gotta adapt in these times with technology. <laughs> it's all about flexibility and agility, Scott. You're, you're, you're moving and dancing and, and that's great. Yeah, I'm feeling good. I, so let's, so I'm, I was just thinking about like you had it pictured in your mind, this, this chart. Like it was on this negative 5%, negative 5% trajectory. You guys come in there and, you know, you, were, you actually even said that you weren't happy with 65% retention. What was it before it was 65% retention? Um, I don't have that data because it was uh, sort of pre, it was in a different database than what we were using now. Okay. And so we don't have that. I, I think it was, um, my, my gut feel is that it was measurably lower at okay. that point. And it's, it's measurably low. And your, your mind, you're saying it's not neuroscience. It's not all this stuff. It's just like, 
hey, 65% retention, it's pretty good, but it could be better. So it's, it's just continually looking at that. How do we benchmark it? How do we tweak it? How do we improve it? How much of an impact did that make like in terms of revenue when you increased the retention from 65 to the 85 that you got? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's huge. I, you know, in, in terms of growth rates, we, we're growing significantly faster than the market. Um, and, and ultimately that's because we acquire the customers initially. And then if you want to grow over time, you know, let's say you're going to acquire a hundred customers a month with your marketing spend, but just hypothetically, right. And some percentage of those are going to come in and they're going to buy, right. Let's say it's you know, incredible conversion rate. You're a 5% conversion. We'll keep the numbers nice and round. If, if you want to keep spending that money and they're making one purchase, you're never going to grow. You're still going to sell to that same 5% and it's still going to keep coming through and it's the same hundred customers. So retention is growth. There's no other way to put it because you can, you know, you can do more acquisition, right? You can double the number of customers you're getting, but that requires investment. And if that investment doesn't pay for itself, you know, that doesn't really work. Your margins, your, your dollar returns, absolute dollars are never going to go up otherwise. So retaining customers is, that is revenue growth. There's no other way to think about it in my mind. And so it's, there's revenue that you can get from straight one-time buyers, right? Somebody comes in and the key there is to make sure that if, if you've got some group of customers that are going to come in and buy and then not come back, that's okay as long as every sale is profitable, right? So let's say you're doing an affiliate network thing and the customers are coming in through an affiliate acquisition and you're basically spending, you know, some percentage of your revenue to, uh, 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 of the price to get those. You've got to make sure that every single one of those acquisitions is profitable. If that's not the case, or you really want are looking to grow the business, retention is huge. And so bumping that 20% uh, additional sort of customer retention, we've grown far faster than that percentage because now those customers have made a second and a third purchase in the same year. And, and obviously it's worth pointing out, I'm sure, unless you briefly mentioned, I didn't catch it, but it's worth pointing out that when cu customers buy a second and third time, there isn't as high a customer acquisition, cost. like that customer acquisition cost isn't no. there. It's much well, it's, profit. That's absolutely true, right? And if, if, you know, once you, our, our cheapest, absolute cheapest, um, marketing strategy is, is around email. You know, we spend less on email than we do on any other marketing play we have, but it's our most, it's our one, it's our largest single revenue stream. And so yeah. converting them over there, it sort of, inc not only is it the cheapest reacquisition, but it increases your profitability, right? So you've got to get through that cycle of bringing folks through it. So absolutely. Yeah. So you guys come into this business, youngster, you, you know, you're, you're doing better on acquisition, but the real, cause I, I, I'm like, I wish I could draw this chart. Cause it was like negative five, negative five, you fix the retention and it's like single handedly sets us on a. Well, and it, 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 we fixed engagement, which is where I think the Shopify store, you know, the, the rebranding to until gone, because people, I mean, people used to write in and say like, is this a real site or is it a credit card scam? Right? Like they look at the youngster, look and feel and that sort of ask those questions. So if I break it down to the growth, you know, the, the experience of coming to a website that was, you know, clean, more modern look, you know, was, you know, gave us a, a pretty significant double digit jump in sales and growth. Everything else has been retention. And yeah, and we're now with the, with the improvement in our ads and our optimizations around that, that's now becoming a very viable acquisition channel. Like I said earlier, it's still very profitable for us. So we're acquiring those customers and retaining 85% of those, which means it's even more profitable on a lifetime value basis. Yeah. Because then I'm switching them from over to email, which is even cheaper, right? So if you think of it on a cost over revenue basis, um, it's less than a percentage um, for email acquisition cost. Right. Whereas, you know, ads, people have ads that typically anywhere from eight to like 25% wouldn't be crazy in an ad spend. Yeah. And, you know, we're much closer to the lower end of that because we've tuned the heck out of it. But the, um, 
there's no question that, that email is the, is the way to go if you can get people captured and, and in that cycle. This is a mind blowing thing just to reflect on for one second is that if you're already doing well, you could be doing 25% better if you were just benchmarking and tweaking and optimizing everything. Yeah, and I mean, the challenge for owners, people launching a business, especially if they're, you know, sort of small, maybe they got a few people in the business, is, is reminding themselves to step back and figure out what should I, I mean, you asked this question right in the beginning, is what should I measure? And, you know, you're running a store, you're taking orders, hopefully you're taking orders, right? You're shipping product, you're sourcing product, manufacturing or, or purchasing, whatever it might be. And then you're still, you got to do the books, you got to pay sales taxes, you got to pay, you know, all of this stuff that just is the day-to-day -day operational thing, right? So you do have to, to make sure, one, that you're taking the time to step back and say, I can't measure everything, but what should I measure and optimize right now? What's my project for this week, today, right? And even if it's only, I don't know, say it's an hour a day that you work on it, right? It's worth it because it will give you those small incremental changes that will add up to significant growth. Yeah, I'm thinking right now, like just from talking to you today, like this is just out of this conversation, I think one of the priorities would be retention. Like, and I think working with a company that can't resell products to customers that they acquired sounds like a project I don't even want to work on because it sounds really stressful. And it's not, because the acquisition isn't like, acquisition is not a business to me. I don't think it's, unless you can make it incredibly profitable, which it sounds like you've done, well, but I mean, you could also look at that as a huge opportunity, right? If you sort of go into a business that's all about sort of acquiring customers the first go around and they're not doing anything for retention, I'd probably buy that company because I'm pretty sure you could uh, really make a good return. Yeah. Fixing that with even some very simple basic changes. If they nailed the acquisition, it wouldn't be that much harder to nail the retention is what you're kind of saying. You would think so, yeah. I mean, that's, that's about customers. I mean, you know, and there were other things, right? Some of it is things, uh, making sure your customer service work. We, we talked a lot about marketing, right? Which is very valid, but we've also invested a lot in customer service. And so there is a, a, there are other aspects to retention besides just, you know, optimizing your emails or your ads or whatever, you know, all of that kind of stuff is great, but they still have to have a good buying experience. They still have to get decent quality products delivered in a reasonable time frame, And then when they need customer service, they have to have a good experience with that. And so we've spent a lot of time doing that to really try to make it, you know, as good as possible. Um, so it's not, not simple, but I think any manager or any owner, you know, when someone leading an e-commerce organization, step back, think about it, but don't be overwhelmed by the, the scale of it, right? It's like, you know, I, I said this earlier, right? You look at Google Analytics and it's like, holy cow, where do I start, right? What yeah. is the, I mean, first and foremost, get Google Analytics working with enhanced e-commerce, right? That's a good place to start. That's not that hard to do. Once you get that working, it can be a little intimidating to say, well, I don't know how to interpret this data. Think about it as a business, right? Are you, you know, ask those questions. Are you retaining customers? Are you acquiring customers? Where are they coming from? Which, which customers are being retained? And this is what I was saying about taking, you know, even an hour a day to step back and think about your business, what's working, what's not. That life cycle model that you talk about, and I've seen your, you know, sneaky flow chart. Our journey. Our value journey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you got, if, if, if people haven't seen that, they should definitely, you know, take a look at it because that's, that whole process, whether it's that one or, or another version, that's what you want to step back and spend some time thinking about and then saying, you know what, my acquisition is not working or my retention is not working or, you know what, I don't even know who my customers are. So go figure that out, right? Pay attention to your demographics, right? Even things as simple as, you know, age, geography, gender starts to change kind of how you think about what you're putting out there as products and how you market and what you present. You know, we've shifted our, our demographics and changed our product mix to account for it, which has led to incremental changes, right? This was a, yeah, so, I was, that's going to be my next question is the product mix, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, uh, I guess all I'm getting at is that ultimately 
you don't need to be intimidated by the amount of information. What you need to do is step back, look at e-commerce as a, um, as a whole end to end picture. I have an employee when I was interviewing her. Um, she's great. I mean, we great conversation. She, you know, talked about, she, she's in our purchasing team and she had said to me, she was asking about marketing and how we do this and customer service. And she'd taken a different job, and, you know, left one company and gone to another one. I was asking her why. And she said, well, I'm a retail nerd. And I was like, well, what, what do you mean? What, what's a retail nerd? Like, I've never heard this before, <laughs> right? And, and what she was getting at is that she loves that end-to-end -end process of how do I acquire a customer and present them with a product that they're interested in, take them through the whole life cycle journey, get them buying again and bringing them back for more and so forth, right? She loved that whole thing. But that's what every owner has to do. And then find the ones that are not working find the data that lets you measure it and start measuring one piece of data and optimizing it and then go on to the next one little step at a time. That's how you build a business. Yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I, I'm like, I would be taking notes, but this is being recorded. So I'll just rewatch it later. <laughs> <laughs> but so like, I, I know we kind of talked about coming in, fixing data, like fixing retention, fixing the split testing, the ads and the emails and subject lines and emojis. But you, you alluded that you did some new things too. Like you added a whole customer service team. Did you, what other new things did you had to introduce to the business to do better? Like was the product catalog something that you needed the product mix that you, something you put a lot of new focus on? Like were there some things that like made a significant impact other than just fixing what wasn't working? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, you brought up some of them right there. So part of it was uh, we really invested heavily in uh, expanding the product catalog. And so we uh, built integrations with a variety of um, partners, people like Channel Advisor that let us get access to larger numbers of vendors and, and solutions. What that let us do is um, service our demographic with a set of products that we didn't have before. And as a result, they became more engaged and bought more. And so what it ultimately did is we started with a small group of uh, partners, suppliers that worked with us. We've more than doubled that in the two years that we've been running and added some very, very large distributors to the mix as well. And what ultimately where we are today is that, um, and I was telling your colleague about this yesterday as we were prepping is, when you know COVID came through and a lot of uh, warehouses and operations closed down because they couldn't get staff or things were problematic, one of the ways that we weathered it was by having such a much larger and more diverse group of uh, partners, because that let us, you know, we might not have had quite as much diversity in our catalog, but we still had a very large catalog that we were able to offer and fulfill on in a reliable way. And so it, there's benefits to it across the board. Some of just having a larger you know, vendor pool is ultimately that you end up being able to offer um, products that fit your demographics better, right? Or things that they wouldn't and, normally buy. And not dependent on any given one. And you're reducing your risk by not being dependent on any given individual uh, business. And so put all that together, we offered We've, we've had a huge expansion in the numbers and types of products we've been able to offer, which means that people find, we're still very selective, right? We're still, we're still offering things that are genuine like deals every day. But what that's meant ultimately is that uh, because our customers are looking for deals, the more diverse and mixed that you can present to them, the more likely you're to get that second purchase, right? Now, if you're a you know, manufacturer running a store or you're sort of a single segment, some of that may not apply, but for most customers, we're running e-commerce sites with lots of sourcing. That's absolutely true. And you want to be able to, you know, if I can present them with a vacuum cleaner when they bought a toaster, then, you know, that's a great second purchase and it kind of reinforces that. And if then they see a pair of jeans that they like, they'll go buy that. And that's another, you know, purchase. And, that breadth gives you some both risk reduction, but also the ability to sort of target your customer more effectively and keep it interesting. So that's a good question. I have a question now that just popped in my mind. So you talked about like reselling, like the second time they purchase, do you put a big focus on like 
average order value? Like, are you bundling? Are you presenting bestsellers? Do you kind of do any custom recommendations on like, a, like associate or, or like similar products and categories? Not, not really in our business. Um, and it's, so e-commerce, uh, if I were running a general purpose sort of, you know, e-commerce site, I'd absolutely do all of what you just described. Daily deal is a niche segment of e-commerce. One of the characteristics of it is that you typically don't see people browsing and buying like multiple items into a cart. Um, you do get some, I mean, you all see people checking out with a dozen items and they just, they kind of went, you know, got on, on the site, got excited and started buying a lot of stuff, which is great. And that's fantastic. But as a marketing strategy, it's not how people engage. Um, one of the things that we were analyzing that was kind of interesting is we send out these emails, right? And we have uh, an image, a title, and then basically a, um, a percentage discount. And then they have to click in to go to the website to sort of see the price and read about the product and get some more, more details. And that's, we've optimized that, made it work great we were getting, you know, we get very high bounce rates as a result because people will literally go down the email and click on every single one and exit the page. And generally what happens is people will click and land, they'll buy that product, they might buy an extended warranty to go with it, and then they're checking out. And that's the cycle. So bundling really doesn't work for us. Um, we do present similar products on the page. So if you're shopping for a MacBook, you'll see a list of laptops across the bottom just because that makes sense. But we, we've never bothered doing things like uh, customers like you also bought because the data and the product mix and the rate of change that we have really doesn't support it. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. It's not going to be the same items all the time. It's something new. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we, we, it's one of the challenges, right? We get all these inbounds from people who want to sell us a great app. It just doesn't fit our buying model. It doesn't fit yeah. the way it works. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really trying to, okay, so anyone listening, I hope that it's resonating deep in your soul that you need to pay attention to these numbers and that you don't need to reinvest a bunch of ads for growth. You can focus on things like retention and, you know, better email subject lines and better CTAs. You can actually look at this data to grow. You don't always have to throw more money into ads. And, but if, you're, if you are throwing more money into ads, hopefully you've optimized that to a point that it's, it's very profitable too. Uh, I'm still just trying to wrap my head around this chart. I know I keep coming back to it because I'm trying to figure <laughs> the growth. Like, so how did it go from like, you know, you got the retention at 85% just to give people an idea of like, what, what's your, like, what's your volume of orders a day? Or like, how can we get a, a, an understanding of like the scope of this business? Like it was on this like negative five trajectory, fix the retention up to 65, then 85. What does that, what does that look like? Like what's your, and, and we'll talk about like the pandemic stuff in a second, but like, what would, like, you're only two years old. I guess you just had your birthday in May, uh, 2020 here, like last month. Yeah. So it's only a two year old business. Like, well, I mean, oh, it was founded in 2005. So to be fair to the business, um, it, there was it, some recognition. yeah, it's, it's been around a while and we bought the install base of users to give us a starting point. Okay. Um, so, so I, you, I want you, to be, you had an email list, you had past customers some like, yeah, I mean, you got to honor what was built before, but yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely, the growth definitely accelerated. And I, you know, we saw the inflection point in September of 2018. We saw it again in February when we launched the sort of retention upgrades and then it's sort of a smooth growing curve through the year as we um, continue to accelerate. And that is that product mix. Um, so you have like a, year, like a year over year percentage. It's pretty, it's pretty good. Like we can just... Yeah, we're, we're, well, we're, we're well into the double digit growth rates um, just on a, even, you know, take COVID and all the sort of craziness around e-commerce around that, well into the double digits without that. And that's not, again, by doing anything that is a, it's not a Hail Mary miracle. It's not, there's, there's, I mean, those don't exist. It's lots of little changes, right? Just like incrementally improving everything by an inch at a time. Yeah. And I have a great team of people. And so, you know, this isn't something where, I mean, yes, I provide leadership and I run the company and all that. But at the end of the day, one of the big mistakes that I've seen people make in, in business in general, and certainly in, in startup retail size businesses, is not to trust and empower the people in their team. So one of the very first things I did is just shut up and listen. 
mm. which I mean, you know, is hard for me to do because I like to talk, but um, some good things. You know, I've got a purchasing director that's been in this in this space for many, many years. And so I just shut up and asked him to tell me about the business and how it worked and what wasn't working, what was working, where he thought we could make fixes. And then we went and made those fixes. And I said, the one thing I said to him is, you can make whatever changes you want. What are the KPIs? How do I measure the success around that change? Okay, go make the change. So we did. We measured it. Some worked, some didn't. The ones that didn't, guess what? We, we reversed them. We didn't do them anymore. The ones that did, we kept. Same with marketing, right? I had a great team of people that were not, they had lots of ideas, but they weren't empowered necessarily to go do it. So if you're running a business, it, whether it's, you know, a, a large team or a small team or even a couple of guys in a warehouse, talk to them, find out what's working and not working because even those little fixes, right? So to take a warehouse operation, customer service comes down to that level of getting the boxes out the door to somebody. If your guy in the warehouse has an idea that makes that better, do it, measure it, and then move on to the next one, right? You, you always reminded me of someone and I think I figured out who it is now. Oh yeah? It, it, it's Steve Jobs. Okay, that's a pretty flattering comparison. <laughs> Let me tell you why. <laughs> so I'm like halfway through this audiobook that I'm listening to. It's about like, it's called Radical Candor by Kim Scott. She was like an executive at Google and then Apple. Yeah. And they talk all about these management styles. And there's, uh, they, they do this quote about Steve Jobs. Or th there was somebody that worked with Steve Jobs all the time. And he said, he always gets it right. He's not always right. He gets it right because he forced right people to challenge him yeah and he would he would get like incredibly upset if somebody recognized something that could be better and didn't bring it to his attention yeah i think that's fair i mean that why wouldn't you right <laughs> i mean you're running a business and but it, i i think it's not just a question of being receptive and encouraging people to come to you i think you as a leader have to go to them and you've got to say you know if you have somebody doing your marketing or your social like listen to them. Do they have ideas? Have you asked them if they have ideas? Have you, I mean, ideally, yeah, you create a culture. This is the, the Holy Grail, right? You create a culture where everybody brings great ideas to you. And if they identify a problem, they bring it to you and identify a fix. And it's great. Like that's the Holy Grail. But it's so easy to, to just turn around as a leader and go back and say, you know, hey, so-and-so, what do you think? What's working? What's not working? Right. What do you think? How could we make this better? How could we get more customers? How could we make them happier? How could we retain them and sell a second product? Right. And, and there's so many uh, interesting things that come out of those conversations. And, you know, we, we've had conversations where we say, that's a really awesome idea. We can't do that right now, but let's put it on the back burner or save it for later or, or whatever. But it doesn't mean you're going to do everything, but but definitely listen. And that was one of the things that we did very early on that I think helped really turn the business around because there's expertise. You can't be, you know, as a president or CEO, whatever you want to call yourself, right? You're not the expert on everything. And this is where I think you can get intimidated as a startup leader is, is people who try to do everything. Sometimes they don't listen because they're control freaks, right? Or they're startups or it's their money. And so they don't necessarily want to do those kind of things. There's a whole, whole bunch of reasons. But step back, calm down a little bit, listen to the experts because you don't know everything. And, you know, even this goes, and I use the, the warehouse guy as an example, right? Warehouse guy, you kind of look at and say, well, he doesn't know anything about e-commerce. He's just stuffing stuff in a box and slapping a label on it but he's also a human being with ideas. And so even that conversation may throw out some interesting ways to think about things and change what you're doing. This is like, um, like at the heart of the, this book I'm reading. I don't know if you should read it or if you should have written it, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it'd be something that you'd probably relate to in this book. But there, you know, she's, it's, it's about being radically candid in our conversations to get to a better yeah. solution. And you have to come equipped with these radically candid conversations with care. Like there's two, two requirements. You have to like care about the person that you're having the conversation with. It's not like a demeaning thing. And there was a second ingredient. I think it was like listening. I think it was like, you have to care and you have to listen, but you have to be radically candid to get to a better result as a team. 
Yeah, I would frame it as you have to show respect even for, you know, you, a lot of times, I mean, you get to be leading a business or, or get senior in an organization or, or you're just, you're the entrepreneur founding it and you might look down on somebody, right? That doesn't work. That's what caring is, is what they're getting at. I think you have to respect what everybody's contributions are, what all their ideas are that they might bring, bring into the table. And you've got to listen genuinely and be accepting of it. And you can't just be like, oh, God, that's stupid, right? You know, like we never, even if it is a stupid idea, you can't do that. Because the next thing that's going to happen is they're never going to talk to you again. And that next idea that your marketing person might have could be the game changer that gets you another 10 points of growth, right? So you want to pay attention to those things and approach it with respect and trust and make sure that you're creating a culture where people will help you with that. Okay, I think I, um, I'm going to actually just hang, bear with me for one sec. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen just to show you this right now. I might as well show everybody else since we're talking about it. You can see it there. So this, 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 these were the two things. You have to care personally and mm -hmm. challenge directly. And when you're able to do those two things, you, you have this radical candor. But if you're missing, like, you know, if, if you're not challenging directly, but you're caring, then it's ruinous empathy. And you're just not, like, all you're doing is, like, caring about the person and not wanting to hurt their feelings. <laughs> and, you know, and, and if you challenge directly, but you don't care, then it's obnoxious aggression. Kind of like what you were saying. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm condescending. I don't need to listen to you, that kind of thing. And yeah. if you don't care, you don't challenge. It's, like, manipulative insincerity, where it's just, like... Well, and I think when you challenge somebody, you show them respect. You're showing them that what they think, what they, you know, the ideas that they might have are interesting and engaging. And then you've got to care because otherwise, or show, you got to be respectful because otherwise, you know, you're just, you're talking down to people. And that's, I mean, why do that? That's stupid. I think you are the rat radically candid leader. And I'm, I'm glad we went there. I never know where I'm going to go in these awesome conversations. I, know, I had no idea we were going to end up talking about leadership <laughs> styles, but we were talking about e-commerce and now we're talking about, about the leadership styles, but, it, but it's an important point, right? In the, in the end, the entrepreneurs, you know, I, I used to do a bunch of mergers and acquisitions in a previous life. And so you spend a lot of time working with a variety of entrepreneurs doing that. And I'm sure in your business, you're talking to people that are in that early stage trying to grow as well and get going. Entrepreneurs are, are, are fantastic. They're awesome people. But there are some leadership challenges that you do run into. And I think what we're talking about here is one of those critical issues is slow down and listen. You know, it, it, it can be eye opening. You don't need to know everything. You do need to trust your people. If you don't trust them and you don't respect them, they're the wrong people. And or you're the wrong person, but most likely they're the wrong people because everybody I've worked with you know, you trust them, you respect them, they contribute, you, you measure the changes, do the KPIs, all the trust but verify stuff. But entrepreneurs can be very controlling. They can think that they have all the ideas and that's a trap to avoid. And so if you're a merchant trying to start out or just grow, look at the team that you've got and spend some time with them respectfully ask them questions, challenge their thinking, see if they can be part of the solution, the ideas, ask them how to make something better. And even if it's the warehouse guy that says, you know, maybe we could stick a coupon in here into every box and have them come back, you know, in 90 days and save 10%. And then you're helping get that second purchase for the third one. Now it, it's kind of a trite example, I admit. Yeah, but, but I, like, it, I think you're doing, like you're actually taking weight off the entrepreneur's shoulder with this advice. It's not all on you. You don't have to carry all that weight. Like you have, you could, you can share the responsibility of with the team and also like everything you've been talking about is like, it doesn't need to be rocket science. We don't always need to invest in ads. We can just benchmark a few things, tweak things and optimize based on data. Um, it's been, it's been great. We're going to, we're getting close to the end of the conversation, but I, I want to finish with uh, three, just, just a question that has three parts to it. Okay. Give us. Do I need to write this down, Scott? Am I going to need to take notes here? It's like the, the rapid fire part of the conversation. Okay. So, and I'm just looking for like one, I don't, I don't want to say growth hack, but I'm going to say growth hack. Like one thing that you've learned about optimizing in like okay. acquisition, ascension, retention. So like what, what is one little thing that you've noticed time and time again? It's like, oh, you got to fix that one little thing for acquisition, ascension, retention. 
Um, so let's start with acquisition. Let's start with acquisition. So for acquisition, um, our biggest thing, at least for, for our business, was fixing our affiliate network because that's a huge source of new customers for us. And we took somebody, it was an up and comer in our company, and we said, you know, take on affiliates and let's see if you can grow this business and, and own it, right? So we empowered her to run and gave her the support. And we challenged her, we asked her questions, we gave her KPIs, things to measure and, and, and did it. And she did an amazing job of building out those relationships. And so, and for, you know, for anyone who doesn't know affiliate, it's really tapping into other people's audiences that have a similar type of buyer that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you like put a lot of focus on other deal sites. Is that kind of like the affiliate angle with you? Well, in, you know, in the deal site world, um, there's a lot of uh, affiliates who focus on things like coupon codes or uh, they have their own email lists. Um, one of the largest is a company called Brad's deals. Um, they, you know, they, they have an email list. I think it's got like 10 million people on it. And so um, building out an affiliate relationship, an affiliate network with them, we use a company called Pepper Jam to manage it all. But that let us really expand that customer acquisition side of it. So for us, that was a very big piece. For others, I think the acquisition learning might be a little different. It may be focused on ads or different pieces. But, but for us in our network, that affiliate influencer type thing was huge. Yeah. And, oh, and I was, I was going to, yeah, I know it's massive for you. I think you have like a, or you had her, but now you have maybe a team that's dedicated to just affiliate, right? Uh, we've got about one and a half on it right now, okay. but yeah. And, and another way of saying affiliate for anybody who's like, oh, this is all new to me. It's like influencer marketing is also affiliate marketing. Type of affiliates, yeah. Yeah, just making sure that that influencer has the right type of audience that's relevant to your yeah. brand and product. Okay, so that's great. Affiliate marketing, I think that's also like, could be less expensive in the beginning than like buying a bunch of... Well, and if you set it up right, it's profitable, right? So, you know, again, you got to measure it, but if you get it right, it's a great way to bring in new customers that you might not have access to. You know, if you can, if you're doing a startup and trying to grow at that acquisition stage, being able to get on some of these other sites, especially with similar audiences. I mean, we're a marketplace more than anything else, but if you have a targeted product, something that you've come up with or, or you're, you know, having built for you or whatever, it fits there as well. You just have to find the right affiliates, the right influencers. And that's a great way to acquire customers. Um, it, it can be much, it, I mean, it should complement a, a decent smart ad strategy, but you know, definitely the learning there is, uh, again, I mean, you're going to get bored of me saying this probably at some point, but measure it. Uh, um, I'm not getting bored. I hope everyone listening is, is like smartening, sharpening their pencils right now and they're going to start measuring stuff better. But that's what we did with affiliates and then ultimately with ads. And so with the acquisition stuff, you got to measure it and manage the, prop, the sort of cost on it within whatever envelope you can afford to make sure that it remains profitable. And that measurement allows you to sort of prioritize your investment and your growth to make sure you actually are acquiring customers in a way that supports your business rather than sort of eating into margins and it doesn't pay for itself. So in that sense, I mean, we, we went on a one particular ad, large ad partner, um, I won't name them, but they, every single dollar we spent them was a money loser we lost money on every transaction they brought to us. So we stopped working with them, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Not a big surprise, but if you were just measuring something like acquisition and you spend, but not really looking at profitability, Lifetime value. you probably missed that. And so that, the, you know, you want to talk about key learning, measure it, right? That's test and measure it. You know, in our case, it was making the affiliates work and then moving on to ads. But again, it was test and measure to make sure that each channel was delivering for us what we wanted in terms of the numbers of customers, the profitability, uh, and that stream. Okay, that was a big one. Like we didn't really talk about affiliate marketing, but that's a massive one. Yeah. So I'm gonna narrow it down to just one more, one more question. And I think it's, it's let's, let's get a, a hack about like a, something that you learned through like email marketing that led to like better retention or better sales, like a subject line 
<laughs> split test. Like what's, what's something that's working right now? Um, you know, it, it's, it's funny you asked that. Like you and I talked about this one before and we had a good laugh about it before, right? So um, there's a lot of uh, arguments out there that people say, well, you should put emojis in your subject lines. And because it, it catches people's interest and it engages and it helps you with open rates and conversions and stuff. So we're like, okay, well, let's give this a try, right? We hadn't done it up to this point. And so, you know, we went in and A-B tested those things. And we A-B tested it six ways from Sunday because we found that when you used emojis, we got fewer conversions, fewer opens and less revenue, which was sort of completely opposite to the, uh, you know, sort of the, 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 the common wisdom, if you will, about sort of the benefits of doing things like this. To recap that, was it, was it increased open rate, but less sales or was it decreased open and decreased sales? Um, I'd have to go back to the data now that you asked me that question, but I think, I think it both went down actually. Um, yeah. but it, it was, the data was interesting primarily because everybody, you know, you search, you know, emojis and subject lines, you'll see all these articles that talk about, Hey, add this, it makes it more dynamic and engaging and people will open and stuff. Exactly the opposite. Um, we just did another test with email with um, rotating images on a product. So most of our images have been static. We tried a test where we, um, we had uh, rotating ones. Like a GIF? Was it like an animated GIF? Yeah, exactly. And it was just showing different images. And we sold more of the product in the rotating image, right? So we sold like three times the units for the, ro the product that was advertised in the road. But our ads have like 12 to 15 products now. And it turned out we actually had less revenue as a whole in that email with the rotating image versus without it. Is it because it was driving sales to that one product but the rest were being neglected? Theoretically. It, that product was more than double our normal AOV. And so you would think it would go up. And so it, it, it was a weird outcome. And so I guess, you know, I. So the growth hack is watch out for emojis, right? If you want a short answer, the, the bigger answer I would say, again, goes back to my favorite subject, get the data and measure it because you're gonna find weird stuff. And I think some of this is, it's, it's, it's driven by who your customer base is. Our customers don't like emojis in their emails. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's a bad idea for your customers. It just means it's a bad idea for our customers. So if you're not measuring, how do you know? You're getting me really excited with that climax there because it all comes back to the same core of this conversation is you can I'm, hear about these like shiny new objects, fancy new marketing strategies, but you do not know unless you measure it. And your customers are gonna be potentially different and react in different ways. And I know I sound like a broken record, but it, it, it's, it bears repeating because this is something that people just don't do. We're driving it home today. I, everyone go and fix your data and you're going to fix your business and grow it. Fix your data, one piece of data at a time, figure out what you need to measure, start measuring it, keep it simple. You don't overdo it, right? You can have too much data overwhelmed, but keep it simple, measure it and then improve it and then go on to the next thing and do it again and again and again. That's what grows your business. Nothing else. Richard, we didn't even get to talking about the pandemic, but I think it's like overdone. So I think we're good. I think um, it's just been an absolute pleasure having you with us again today. I think we would love to check back in with you in like six months or, sure. or so and, and see how you're doing. So thank you a ton. Like that was so I'll say in six months, Scott, we're going to be middle of Q4. So I'm not going to be talking to you at all. So forget okay. about it. But maybe next, maybe, maybe well, before Q4. Maybe we'll come back to Seattle if travel opens up again. Yeah, that sounds good. I think someday we'll actually be able to go out and, uh, you know, get have a drink in a bar or something. About time. All right. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much, Richard. Absolute pleasure having you. See you later and see you later, everybody.